webinar. Um, before we get into today's webinar, just some quick housekeeping, let you know a little bit about who we are, who I am, and then we'll hop into today's webinar. Drugfreeazkids.org. We are a program of Southwest Behavioral and Health Services. We are also an affiliate of the National Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. And we do programs all across um, the state, but mainly right now we're focusing here in Maricopa County, but we do bring programs across the state um, through our Community Alliance program. Um, and when other opportunities arise, we do like getting out to different parts of the state. Um, this project is supported through a grant by the Governor's Office of Youth, Faith, and Family and the Arizona Parents Commission on Drug Education and Prevention. We're very grateful um, for the opportunity to bring webinars like this to you um, free of charge. Also, part of that funding um, enables us to get out to community groups, schools, churches, and folks um, throughout the county um, to talk to parents and caring adults for our active parenting workshops. Those workshops are six sessions long and talk about everything from communication to cooperation, discipline, and how to instill these qualities of character in your kid so that way it can hopefully result in raising healthy drug-free children. We also uh, deliver presentations that are a one-time presentation talking about marijuana, alcohol, prescription drugs, and tobacco and e-cigarettes as well. And aside from those programs, we also are featured in a number of publications throughout the state, um, both Spanish and English publications, um, a lot of parenting articles, uh, and just different information and different mediums to get out the um, what it is that we do here at Drug Free Easy Kids. And our goal here at DrugFreeEasyKids.org is to be the resource for you, whether you're a parent, a caring adult, a prevention specialist, whoever you may be, to help impact young people in a positive way so that they can grow up to be healthy, drug-free adults as well. So who am I? Um, again, my name is Justin McBride. I'm a program manager here at Drug Free Easy Kids. And I was born and raised right here in Arizona, graduated from South Mountain High School. I did leave the state for a little while. I lived um, back east in North Carolina and overseas for a while while I was part of the United States Marine Corps. Um, I also lived in California for a little while as well. Um, what brings me to this position today and why I'm so passionate about the work that I do is I've been working with young people and parents for quite a while through Students Against Destructive Decisions, also known as SAD, and the Girls Clubs, and creating programs for the Office of National Drug Control Policy um, for youth prevention uh, activities for them as well. So for me, I really do take um, pride in being able to share information to help people that do have an impact on young people's lives every day and hopefully make it a little easier um, for them along the way. All right, so enough about me and let's get into today's webinar. I will refer to a couple of our past webinars throughout today's um, webinar. If you haven't got a chance to check those out, that's okay. You can always check those out on our website. We uh, upload those onto our website, the recorded version of the webinar, so you can always check those out if I do refer back to something that you want a little bit more information on as well. Rx to H, prescription drugs to heroin. Uh, prescription drug and heroin abuse are definitely two issues that are connected and do have a link. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. We're going to look at prescription drug abuse, and we're going to look at heroin abuse, and we're going to look at how the two of those are connected. Then we're going to look at some strategies that uh, parents and caring adults can use um, to prevent drug abuse among young people. So before we get into prescription drugs or heroin, we need to look at why do kids use drugs in general? Why do kids even decide they want to try it out? Well, I'll cover this real briefly because I know a lot of you are joining me. Um, this isn't your first time joining us. So I'll refer back to a couple webinars that we had. Um, one where we talked about why kids use. And understanding why kids use is very important because if we know why they use, we can better have an impact or be a filter um, to prevent them from using in the future as well. So looking at certain things like curiosity. Sometimes kids are just curious. They're trying to make sense of the world. Think about even a young child. You can see how curious they are when they're picking pencils up or their blocks or rocks and 
They're putting them in their mouth and their nose and their ears. They're trying to figure out what these things are, what things do. Well, as kids get older, that curiosity doesn't just go away. And when it comes to drug and, drugs and alcohol, it doesn't just disappear too. Kids are curious what the effects of some of these are going to be. No matter how much we tell them, kids sometimes are still going to have a, a certain level of curiosity. That's why it's important that we do arm them with the facts um, as, because of that curiosity. Think of a kid who we tell not to touch an iron. Are they always going to touch the iron because it's hot and we tell them don't touch the iron, right? Are they always going to touch it? No. But a lot of times kids are going to touch that iron. And as they get older, it, it's up to us to really build that line of communication so that way they can, um, they can trust the information that we're bringing to them as well, which is something we talk about in our parenting workshops as well. We really get into communication. Another reason why kids use maybe body image or coping with stress they're trying to, maybe they're not even having to do with anything what we consider negative. And they're actually trying to use it for something positive because they want to improve their academic performance. And they've heard certain drugs can help you focus more. Whether or not that happens to be true or the negative effects are probably greatly outweighing any positive benefit, they're not necessarily going to see that. They may just see it as a positive and something to help them. Or athletic performance. Things with like steroids that are going to help them um, make the team, so to speak. Then we also have all the reasons that kids feel they may want to use or need to use drugs. And then that goes hand in hand with perception. Perception of risk and perception of social approval. And you can see on this chart, and I go into more depth on this chart in one of our past webinars. But what I'm talking about here is you can see this table. As it gets to a darker red, that means kids are going to be more likely to engage in a risky behavior. So as kids perceive, or anyone, perceives something to be riskier and less socially accepted, they will be less likely to engage in that type of behavior, which you can see on the bottom left of that perception chart right there. Now, as they perceive something to be more socially accepted and they perceive it to be less risky, they're going to be more likely. That'd be the top right-hand corner. And so that's kind of a chart that just shows how perception of risk and perception of social approval works. And the reason it's not just risk and social approval, and the reason that it's perception of risk and perception of social approval is because what kids perceive to be the case is not always true. So um, certain things may come out in the media that they perceive something to be one way when in fact it's not, or because of what their friends are saying, they perceive it to be less risky or more socially accepted when in fact it's not. Let's look at two things uh, real quick and then we'll move on to the next slide. Think about cigarettes and marijuana. Um, tobacco cigarettes. Um, over the past decade or so, we've done a really good job at letting young people know how harmful, that, how, how harmful they can be to your health. And also, we've changed policies and a number on local, state, federal levels that have made it seem less socially acceptable to smoke. So as the perception of risk increased and the perception of social approval decreased, that's where we saw smoking fall. Um, smoking rates among young people really start to fall. Now looking at marijuana over the past several years, the opposite's been happening, where policies have been changing across the country where pe young people may perceive it to be more accepted and they also may perceive it to be less risky because there's all the, the, the celebrities that are talking about it. We see it on the news where people are joking about it and really make light of a serious drug. But in their minds, it doesn't seem like a serious drug. So that's how perception works. Understanding why kids use is just as important as trying to prevent kids from using um, drugs altogether. So why do kids use prescription drugs? Looking at what we just talked about, let's let's remember that. So keep in mind perception of really keep in mind the, the the chart on the right perception of risk and perception of social approval. Now let's take a look at prescription drugs. Well, most kids look at them as sanitized, sanctioned, and safe. What does that mean? Well, it means that they they're clean. They're not something that's just created in somebody's garage. They think, well, heck, they're made in some sterile facility um, by a medical company that's licensed to do this with doctors, and it, it's something that's clean. It's sanctioned, right? 
It's something that the FDA has approved for certain reasons. So it's, it's got to be accepted, right? It's accepted by society. Um, and we see it all over the place. We see it on billboards. We see it on the TV. We hear it on the radio. We are bombarded with prescription drug advertisements and marketing all over the place. And then perception of risk. Well, heck, it is safe because it is sanctioned by the FDA as well. So because it's sanctioned safe and sanitary, kids are going to be more likely to engage in this just because they don't really see the harm in doing so a lot of times. Is that the case for all kids? No. But when you look at prescription drugs compared to something, let's say, meth or what we'll talk about later, heroin, the perception of the two um, can be very different because one is approved and used legally by many people. Also, let's, we're going to go back and um, I won't read the whole slide for you guys. I know most of you can read as you're here. So, uh, but let's take a look back at the 90s. And we can really, that's where we really start to see an increase in the number of prescription pain uh, medication, uh, pain relievers being um, written, prescriptions were being more written, excuse me, more prescriptions were being written and dispensed in the 90s. That's really where it started to pick up. And that's because there were new drugs that were coming out, there were new claims that were coming out by these drugs that were supposedly not addictive as compared to previous medications that were out there. There was also um, the um, different ways that the drugs were released into our system. So we have the extended release um, medications that, that were meant to be released inside our body over a long period of time. So that way we somebody wouldn't have to be taking pills as often or as frequently. So it would, just get, be, it would get released in their body over time. Um, However, when that gets abused and it gets crushed up, you're getting that the full impact of what's meant to be over several hours, whatever it would be with that drug, all at once, too. So we really started to see a lot of changes with um, pain relief and medication and the claims that were out there. And the idea was if people are in pain, we need to treat the pain, treat the pain. And am I saying we don't treat people in pain? Not what I'm saying. I'm just saying in the 90s, that was really the main focus. Uh, that started to become more of a focus, I should say, is treating the pain. We have to treat the pain in order to treat the person. And, and so that really started to lead to more aggressive advertising by pharmaceutical companies, more aggressive marketing by pharmaceutical companies that were going out to talking, talking to doctors and uh, to different types of physicians and letting them know about the different medications that were supposedly non-addictive. And at the time, there weren't as many long-term studies done on these medications, so the full long-term effects and um, people developing dependency may not have been fully known. It's not really until medications become widely used by the general population that we see the potential for abuse sometimes just because in a controlled environment, you're probably going to be less likely um, to have people abuse the medication because it is a very kind of strict regimen of how often you're taking the medication and what you're taking it with, what you're eating it with, your other medications, so that way they can really find out the interaction um, that it has with other medications and your body. That's what happens through testing. And then when you fast forward into the general population, um, they're not going to have that strict scrutiny over every individual that gets prescribed the medication. So this kind of helped build this idea that prescription medication in general, and even more so prescription pain relievers, were more um, socially accepted, they were more available, and they were just really all over the place as compared to previous years. Now, most of us probably think, well, if you get prescribed by a doctor a pill, you're supposed to use a pill. And, you know, nine times out of, the ten, out of ten, that's probably the case. However, when we look at increased availability of any substance and higher abuse among adults, a lot of times that's going to translate over to young people as well. Some people tell me, though, you know what, when it comes to um, prescription drug abuse in kids, it's really not that big of a deal. How many kids are really abusing prescription drugs? Well, let's take a look at this. Um, just how many kids? How many kids are, I guess, disposable? Because it's not that big of an issue if we say that it's not that big of an issue. Well, 
looking at eighth graders, this is eighth grade. 9.3 percent of eighth graders tell us that they've used prescription drugs to get high. Um, that's almost 10 percent. So almost one out of 10 kids telling us, yeah, I've used prescription drugs to get high before they even enter high school. That's a lot of kids. And especially considering where the information is coming from, that may not even be the, the total number of kids. This comes from the Arizona Youth Survey, which is a very, it's a great um, source of information that we get um, every two years from the Arizona Criminal Justice Commission that talks to us about different risky behaviors that kids may be engaging in and helps us um, track trends in that, those types of behaviors and drug use. Um, however, if somebody asks you, um, and you're a kid, and you're taking a survey at school, and even though it's anonymous, and if somebody says, can you take this survey and tell us if you use drugs or not, are you going to be more or less likely to really divulge everything? So if that's what kids are reporting, you know, there is a possibility that that number is even higher. Now, as, kid, as we get into 10th grade, you're looking at 15% of 10th graders, that's sophomores in high school, using prescription drugs to get hot. So that's not just getting prescribed from a doctor and using them as intended. That is 10 or 15 percent of 10th graders using them for the purpose of getting high. 12th grade, we're up to just about 19 percent of 12th graders that tell us. So just a, almost a fifth of kids by the time they leave high school will have used a prescription drug to get high. And what we do know about addiction is the earlier some somebody starts engaging in substance use, um, whether it be prescription drugs, marijuana, alcohol, that the higher the likelihood they will develop a dependency later in life. So that's really scary looking at almost a fifth of kids leaving high school will have already used a drug, uh, prescription medication to get high. So where are they getting it from? 25% are getting this from home, 59% um, are getting it from a friend. And when we think, well, not everybody is getting it from home. Well, the kids that are getting it from a friend, where do we think their friends are getting it from? A lot of times those are the 25% that are getting it from home from home as well. It could it's not necessarily that they're they're going in and they're stealing it sneakily because you know from mom and dad's active prescription that they're using. It could be a prescription that mom and dad have forgot about altogether and has been sitting in the medicine cabinet. Nonetheless, the medications are still there and available to use. So we have a number of different types of medications that can be abused. And I'll go through these really quickly for time's sake. You have your stimulants, you have your sedatives, and then you have your pain relievers. And these different types of drugs will have different effects in each um, brand and type, of, you know, specific pill and the dosage will have different effects and risks that go along with it. But when we look at the link between prescription drug abuse and heroin abuse, we're really talking about pain relievers. And looking at some of these effects and risks that go along with abuse of things like, uh, um, like our morphine, our Percocets, our Vicodins, and our codeines, all these different types of drugs, I want you to keep these effects and risks in mind when we take a look at heroin because they're going to be very, very similar to those. So what does all of this have to do with heroin? It's prescription drugs. What does this have to do with heroin? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with heroin. Um, when somebody becomes prescribed a medication, um, um, whether they are prescribed by a doctor or they start taking it recreationally, um, they have the potential to become dependent on that substance. And when somebody does develop a dependency on a medication, or especially an opioid, um, and it becomes a habit, well, that becomes a very expensive habit to, um, to continue to, to fund. Prescription drugs are expensive. And looking at something like maybe $40 to $80 for certain pills out there versus a bag of heroin that is $5 to $15 per bag and may have some of the same effects that the prescription drugs do as well. Well, you're thinking, well, how would someone jump from prescription drugs all the way over to heroin? Well, as you develop a dependency on drugs and you aren't able to get them from a doctor anymore and people start finding other ways to obtain certain substances, um, like their, say, Vicodin or other opioids that are out there, 
um, they go to people that they know can acquire these medications. A lot of times the people who have extra prescription drugs to dole out and are the quote unquote dealers, and it's not always a scary guy in the alleyway either, um, those people also have access to other substances as well many times. Um, or they know people that will have access to something. So if it becomes harder and harder for somebody to afford that type of a habit, it's very, um, it, it's, it's very scary to see how easily they can just progress to the point of, you know what, I can try this. Because heroin is not what we're always thinking, where you may think, oh, somebody's just shooting up. I'll get into the uses later. It could come in a pill form. It could come in a smoked form. So as somebody progresses from prescription drug abuse to heroin abuse, and you look at the steps along the way and what it takes to get there, it's not walking into a doctor's office one day, getting prescribed Vicodin, and then the next day they have a needle in their arm. There is a progression that gets there. And as somebody develops a dependency on a drug and they need a stronger, more powerful high, you can see how they can start to progress from something like a prescription medication from their doctor to they're not getting enough and now they have a dependency on it. Now they have a need to get more of it that they can't get from their doctor. So they're going to people that they know can obtain it for them. And then when that becomes too expensive or they run out or somebody wants to offer a cheaper solution, you can just really see how it starts to go down that road um, more easily than we would like to think. Because the perception of risk and access to heroin is not probably what, among teens, is not what we think. In the 70s and 80s, we thought of heroin really as kind of the junkies and people strung out with a needle in their arm just laying out. And that's what the movies were depicting. And that's probably what we thought when we were younger. That, may, that might have been some of our perceptions of heroin. And sometimes when we do get perception of risk and access to a substance, to be at a point where it's harder for young people to use, sometimes we forget about it, and then we see trends starting to come back. Because the fact is, teens today do have a different view of heroin than we may have had in the past. Um, and teens find it easier to get. Heroin being fairly um, or very easy to get is something that is asked of young people. And 20% of 12th graders say that it's fairly or very easy to get heroin meaning that there's still a bunch out there that say, oh, it might be a struggle, but I could still get it. That's a lot. And only 59% of 12th graders see great risk in trying heroin once or twice. And you say, well, that's good. That's the majority. But that means that 40% don't see a great risk in trying heroin once or twice. So when you look at the perception of risk and you look at the availability of heroin or the perception of availability, that's where we can get into trouble with young people assuming that heroin's not going to be an issue. So what is the, oops, I think we skipped over, it's loading for a second. So as we look at the national and we look at the local impact of heroin, um, we do know that this is something that is affecting us here in Arizona. We also know that this is something that's affecting us nationwide. Here in Arizona, we know that um, heroin-related deaths from 03 to 2013 went from 65 to 126. That's a pretty big jump, and those are the heroin-related deaths. That doesn't include um, overdoses that didn't result in a death where they may have been able to bring somebody back or where it got to the point of needing rehab or um, even mild intervention or different steps along the way. That's just the one extreme of the situation. So we do know it's an issue here. We do see heroin rising. And somebody, um, somebody was talking to me about, well, how likely really is somebody to use heroin, right? Is there really a big link between prescription drugs? Like, yeah, maybe they're a little bit more likely. I think this chart um, says it all. And um, this is not a chart that I created. Um, all The link, I, if you can see it, is down there below. Um, and I'll send everybody who attended this all my sources for my information later. But looking at people who are addicted to alcohol, two times more likely um, to use heroin um, or to become addicted to heroin. Marijuana users, three times. Cocaine, 15 times. Prescription opioid painkillers, 
40 times more likely to develop a heroin um, addiction. And so that right there tells us that there is a clear link between heroin use and prescription drug abuse. And these are two problems that we really need to approach in the same way. But how do we approach this? It, what's the big, the big answer? Well, I'll tell you right now. Um, there are some separate things that we can do with prescription medications, but at the end of the day, talking to our kids about the dangers of drugs, the dangers of alcohol, the importance of making healthy decisions, and having those conversations is really where it's at. There isn't some drastic new solution that we need. It comes down to parents and caring adults talking with young people about the dangers of these substances. Something specifically that we can do with prescription drugs um, or medication in general, safeguard our medication. If we have young people in our house, even if we trust our kids, right, because it's never our kid, well, you never know who, what their friends are going through in their life that may come into the house, or heck, some of our own friends that we may have over to the house. We don't know the things that they may be struggling with. So safeguarding prescription medications by using lock boxes or storing them in places where there isn't access to them is, is one of the easiest ways to reduce access to these medications. There's also um, drop boxes, um, medicine drop boxes or kiosks that are located in um, different pharmacies or different police stations. If you just Google um, prescription drug drop off or drop box or med return, you can, you can pull up a ton of them in your area. It's going to vary from area to area because different places have them and some. So next to safeguarding, what do we do? We can act as a filter. Because we have all this information coming in on TV, um, on the billboards, talking about prescription drugs and the benefits and how they can be helpful, and you know what? I'm not going to say that those are all false. Many of the claims of the prescription drug companies may be true and are true. The fact, though, is that kids aren't going to necessarily understand when it's appropriate to use them and when it's not. And this is something we can start talking about from an early age. Um, even looking at preschool years and talking about medicine and the importance of only taking medicine that's prescribed to us or given to us um, from mommy or daddy um, and talking about that and making healthy life choices. That's something that we can start very, very early and talking about how prescription drugs, when taken not as prescribed or not following the directions that were given by a doctor, can be extremely harmful to us. So those are messages we can start having early and often. I have it right over here. Um, wanna, if you can see this, it says, keep calm and talk often. And that's true. We need to keep calm and talk often about all of these substances and the dangers that they um, the dangers that they can have to a young person or to anyone in general. And it's not just talking often. Some parents think, oh my gosh, I have to sit down and have a drug talk with my kid once a week, you know, for three hours. I'm not saying we need to get up there with a PowerPoint presentation and have an in-depth conversation and meeting every single week about drugs. But having those frequent conversations when they arrive, when you see a, a TV commercial that talks about a prescription medication and it lists off 30 seconds worth of um, side effects, and you know we all chuckle at it, use that as an opportunity to talk to our kids. Be that filter, because a filter doesn't mean we're going to just prevent our kids from seeing any of these messages, or be able to prevent our kids from ever um, being offered drugs, or prescription medication, or heroin, whatever the substance may be. It means that we can be a filter in talking about what healthy choices look like and what some dangerous uh, and what some of the dangers are associated with these drugs. Clearly communicating expectations. This is something really big that I've talked about in past webinars, and I'll probably talk about every webinar. Clearly communicating expectations is key. Just because kids may think we'll upset with them if they find out uh, if we find out that they're using a drug doesn't mean that we've clearly communicated expectations. We may have clearly communicated we'll be mad or they think we'll be mad, but that doesn't mean we've talked about what our expectations are. Things like drug use in this house is not, is, is not acceptable by anyone of any age. People drinking under the age of 21 in our house 
is not accepted. Smoking in our house is not accepted. We need to have clear um, expectations set for our kids where they understand what the consequences are, both the natural consequences um, and some of the consequences that we're going to have put in place um, or develop even with their help. We can come up with family contracts. That's something that's very successful for a lot of families. You can find more information about that on our website. But talking um, early and often and communicating these expectations is really important. Because when, at, when kids were asked, um, kids who used uh, or abused substances, whether well, it be prescription drugs, marijuana, alcohol, whatever the drug was, when they were asked about what their parents would think if they found out, most of them said their, their parents would be mad. But when they were asked if their parents had talked to them about the dangers of drugs and alcohol, many of them said they had not talked to their parents about that. So that just shows a disconnect between um, what we may expect for our kids and what they think the, the expectations are. They may think that the expectation is just part of growing up and it's something that I have to figure out on my own and everybody does it. So it's really important that we clearly communicate those expectations help build resilience within our kids, having plans um, in place for them, an emergency plan, talking to them, having conversations um, when they have questions, listening to the underlying question that may be there when our kids talk about certain things. Um, there's so many opportunities throughout the day um, where we can um, help build resilience. And it starts with listening and active listening. In our active parenting workshops, we talk about active communication and how important active listening is. Uh, if you check out our website um, under programs and then workshops, you can find more information about our webinars, excuse me, our workshops for active parenting that are coming up, if that's something that would interest you as well. What else can we do? Armor ourselves with the information that we need. Stay up to date with the trends that are going on among young people, whether it be in Arizona or outside our state, because a lot of times, um, just because it's in one state doesn't mean it's not gonna cross over here to Arizona. Um, it, it's good to stay up to date on different strategies as well. You can find a lot of that at our website. We have tons of resources um, from conversation starters to past webinars that goes into more depth on different types of substances. We have our drug guide on our website and all the information about our upcoming parenting workshops as well. That is all I have for you guys today. I wish we could stay and talk for hours more, but I know a lot of us are strapped for time. Many of you are joining us for a lunch hour. I wanna open it up for questions right now. I am going to put on a survey and then I'll put my contact info. If you could take a minute just to take this brief survey, um, this allows us to better the webinars and better our program. Uh, and get information that's relevant. If you have any comments, feel free to leave a comment about future webinars that you might be interested in, topics you want to hear about. Now I would like to open up the floor for questions because I know we went really fast over a lot of that information. If you do have questions, please throw those in the chat box right now. I'd be more than happy to answer those. And while you are answering the poll, uh, the survey, and thinking of any questions, I will let you know this is being recorded. I will send a link out to everybody along with the resources so that way um, you can find, you can go in the direction that you want to go from here. I know a lot of times I watch a webinar and I just want to get the meat and potatoes so that way I can find out what's important to me and then where do I get more information. And that's what these webinars are really meant to be for. Next month we do have a webinar um, where we're talking about adverse childhood experiences and the connection that they have to, that has to substance abuse. I encourage you all to register for that. If you attended today's webinar, you will be getting an invite to that as well. So I encourage you um, to register for that when the time comes. You can also register for any of our upcoming webinars at drugfreeasykids.org slash webinars. So it looks like we still have some people answering our poll right there. I do appreciate you guys commenting and leaving um, your feedback. I really do appreciate that. Um, feel free in the future when you get an invite to the webinars, you can forward that out to as many people as you like. The more people that we can get this message out to, the better. 
If I don't have any questions at this point, I will take that as a compliment, meaning I answered all your questions in the webinar. Um, if not, you think of something later, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm going to go ahead and end the survey right now in just about two seconds. So if you're continuing to take that, please wrap it up. And I'm going to end it in five, four, three, two, one. And done. All right. My contact info is up on the screen. Feel free to shoot me an email, call me if you have any questions, um, and look out for the follow-up email and invite for our future webinars. Thank you guys so much for joining DrugFreeAVKids.org, a program of Southwest Behavioral and Health Services for today's webinar. Have a great day.